And I'm going to uh, introduce um, the next two speakers. Uh, first, we're going to have uh, Casey Nash from Maine uh, come up and, and talk to us about um, the benchmarking studies in Maine. Uh, Casey is the uh, asphalt pavement engineer uh, for the materials testing and exploration branch or, or whatever office of the main DOT. So Casey, are you ready to go? Okay. Y'all give a uh, welcome Casey as he comes on up. Yep, the brightness up here is very off. That's pretty intense. All right, so thank you, Randy. Um, you know, I actually haven't even reviewed that uh, implementation guide yet, but, you know, the latest draft. So I'm looking forward to the reduced stat 16 down to eight. Much more feasible, much more reasonable. Um, and some of the things that you, top, you, you talked about there are talking about like the variability aspect as well. Um, that's huge. One thing that we haven't really talked much about at this balanced mix design implementation conference is balancing the mix design. We've kind of talked about, does it meet a performance limit? But what about balancing it? Is that really balanced if it meets the minimum? I mean, it's, it meets criteria, but is it really balanced? So that, in, in my mind, balanced mix design is the best world of both, right? So we talk a lot about rutting and cracking. Um, that aspect, does it just barely meet the minimum on one end or the other? Well, you could go that way. You could lean one way or the other based on your local distresses. Um, but truly balanced is meet in the middle, uh, and then you're able to, that, that inherent production variability with the gradation, the asphalt content, your materials, you have some room before you actually drop beneath one of those limits. So that was just a, one, one thing that you had mentioned about that we haven't really talked much about balancing the design um, and, and getting away from just doesn't meet the minimum, you know, the verification piece. So I just wanted to just kind of top mention that because I don't go into it in depth in this slide here, but it was a, something I just wanted to follow up Randy on. Um, so yeah, I'm the asphalt pavement engineer for Maine DOT. Um, we've been doing performance testing for several years now. Uh, I'm here just to give you an idea of our benchmarking effort in hopes that some of the information will be useful for other states and other contractors. Um, so I'm going to cover the, the, our motivation, uh, some of our background with the testing, uh, the methodology that we're currently in, investigating and looking into for the benchmarking effort, um, some of our takeaways at this point that we've learned, um, and just some questions we still have and questions that everyone will always have. <clears throat> so the primary motivation is that Maine DOT has seen a reduction uh, in pavement life. Uh, our pavements aren't lasting as long as they used to, and they're not lasting as long as we're saying they're going to. You know, no, no, I, I, there are very few 20 year pavement lives now. So when you look at some of this mechanistic design that's predicting out to 20 year life, uh, that's wrong. It, it's, we just, we're not seeing it. Not with, not with asphalt pavement, at least not in Maine. Um, we're seeing early failures, even when the mix design meets volumetric criteria, criteria, uh, with some of the newer, you know, higher wrap, rubber, plastic, additional modifiers, emulsifiers, there's, all these additional pieces are really complicating the, the baseline volumetrics, even just the, the, the most common one, just polymer. Adding polymer can completely change a design and, and, its, and its productivity and, you know, and, and how it lasts out in the field, but volumetrics don't show that. You don't, you don't really catch that with a volumetric analysis. So that's really the, the, another a big motivation for performance testing is because it, the original sharp piece was a lot of people have implemented volumetric design, but haven't really filled, filled out the entire original intention of performance verification. <clears throat> and we want to be able to provide flexibility to contractors to innovate. Uh, we've had increasing prices significantly over the last few years um, to the point where our upper management is hesitant to look into new innovations, uh, implement new ideas, or look into other options. It's, if anything, it's it's almost pushing them to reconsider our specifications and maybe loosening them some to try to be able to decrease costs, which is wrong. Uh, you know, it's just, it's just, it's just the wrong direction. <clears throat> so 
we need to we need to make sure we work good with the climate with our contracting agency and our contractors, but as well as our own upper management within the agencies. Um, they, I can't stress that enough. We, they need to be on board. Um, we can't, we can't just because the contractors are having a difficulty meeting a specification doesn't mean the specification is wrong. Doesn't mean the criteria is wrong. Um, we just need to work together to try to improve the ability. Uh, and, and, you know, everyone talked about training, right? Training is huge where the workforce is, is lacking right now, uh, on everyone's side. So. We want to be able to provide some flexibility, open up the specifications some. <clears throat> uh, so this is just some of a background of, of Maine, how Maine uh, does their mixed design process. So our contractors actually are the ones that do uh, the volumetric mixed design. They submit the, pay, the paperwork and the overall package to us, similar to Vermont. Um, we go through and, and, and make sure that it meets the volumetric design criteria and meets our specifications. Um, and then we also, we then go and verify the aggregate consensus qualities. And then we actually, the, for full approval of a design, the contractor needs to submit a plant verification. So we do, we actually verify their volumetric design through a plant produced uh, sample to truly approve the design. Um, this is just some of our information here, what our test criteria is. We primarily use a 6428 and a PG64E28. Um, and we do all of our designs at 65 gyrations because we were seeing that Basic contractors, the only difference we were seeing a lot of times between the 50 and 75 gyration design was tweaking the asphalt content. And so that's that's the wrong, that's the wrong as far the wrong thing as far as performance goes. Um, we implemented Hamburg Wheel Tracker back in 2016. Um, and the primary issue there was rivaling and rutting. Um, we so we've been investigating, as you see here, the additional tests over year after year. It's always one of the never ending question. What test is right? Um, we've chose the initial test there, the Hamburg uh, and the ideal CT, um, based on some of the accelerated load facilities um, and the, the correlation to the accelerated load facilities field performance. We don't have the history of cracking associated to a cracking test because it takes years and years. So the, our best option to be able to select a test is based on those accelerated load facilities. Um, we actually intend on investigating using mist and moisture induced stress test. Uh, along with ideal CT to be able to potentially be able to use the ideal RT as a surrogate to Hamburg during production, um, because it will allow quicker assessment of that susceptibility, uh, as long as it continues to show and rank mixes similarly to the Hamburg. Um, so for our typical acceptance samples, we get two, two boxes, we get two box sample, and then we also get two additional boxes from that same split um, for contractor dispute, if there's a dispute, if there's a disputable property. Um, if that's not disputed after a couple of weeks, we then go through a list and we make sure we hit every single mixed design that is produced in the state, um, every design and asphalt, you know, asphalt grade variable. Um, and we make sure that we mark two of those boxes and set them aside for winter, winter testing. So then when we have every single mixed design from every contractor in the state, we have volumetric properties, and then we have you know, two to four boxes, so you know, anywhere between 20 to 40,000 grams of hot mix uh, to be able to do performance tests, to be able to associate, like, and so that we're doing this uh, as an agency to try to be able to provide the contractors uh, that benchmark variable. So we, they have an, an idea of where they stand. <clears throat> At this point, uh, for the Hamburg, we've ran approximately 1,300 tests, AMPT, about 2,000 tests, uh, 100 different mixtures. The ideal CT, 3,200 tests. So you can see that just simply the ability, the, 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 we, you know, the ideal CT and the ideal RT, those are some of the latest ones we've been investigating. I mean, you can just see the numbers and how quickly you're able to assess a, a mixture. It's just, it's just more reasonable uh, for an agency and more implementable. Um, and we're, you know, we're, we just started looking at the high temperature IDT uh, as well, because if we have a little mix after we're done with a, after we're done with a Hamburg, ideal CT and ideal RT, figured why not? Let's might as well start, you know, just another test that we're interested in, potent, in the potential value. Um, so the overall methodology with balanced weeks design, yeah, Randy, I plan on taking advantage of your uh, extra time if you don't mind. Uh, the balanced mix design methodology, I mean, most people are fully aware of what it is. We're balancing, you know, you pick a couple key criteria, some, something that's, that, that's a concern in your state. So in, in, in most cases, we're, we're balancing rutting and cracking. Um, so as you increase or decrease the asphalt content, you're going to have a, result, a change in performance of that cracking. Increase the asphalt content, you're going to have 
more of a risk of rutting, it decreases it, you're gonna have more of a risk of cracking. Um, but what happens when that volumetric optimum, the volumetric design doesn't fall within that acceptable performance range? What, what do you do then? You know, so do you go through and should we just shift the asphalt content and still keep the same volumetric criteria? That's not gonna work. There's, that's just, you know, but it's obvious that we obviously need to shift the asphalt content to be able to gain the, the necessary performance. Um, should we ease or remove some of the volumetric design criteria? Yeah, in my mind, in my you know, I, I think yes. This is an opportunity to be able to loosen up some of the some of the specifications, be less less prescriptive. Um, should we pay, change the PG grade? Uh, we've been doing some in, some some lab work where just shifting the grade, um, you can have a significant improvement. So you can still maintain the same volumetric criteria and improve the grade and improve your performance. Um, should we use a different test? Just because it doesn't the, the volumetric target doesn't fall within our performance range. Is that performance range right? Uh, or should we just reject the design? Should we say, we're, we're so confident in these performance tests that this volumetric design won't meet the performance criteria, it's rejected, go back to the drawing board. I don't think that's the right direction either. Uh, so for our benchmarking effort, we're primarily going with the balance mix design approach A, uh, which is using that volumetric target, um, that, that, that volumetric that asphalt content, um, and then just verifying the performance. So we're using the contractor's design. We're not having them shift the asphalt content. We're not trying to do lab batches. We're doing this all on plant produced mix from the, from the contractors. So we really can only do it at their produced asphalt content. Um, here's an example of just some of the data, uh, how we're looking at it. And, and you've seen some of these performance space diagrams before. It's a nice way to be able to visualize the balancing of your properties. Um, this isn't all of our data. This is just a, a slide of I had, some of the data I looked at. We had worked with last year, um, but I just wanted to be able to give an idea of kind of what what we're seeing. So in Maine, we've we've implemented the Hamburg, which is a rut test. We don't have a cracking test, so you can see the overall you know centralization of the data is pushing up to the upper left, a stiffer mix. So we're you know we're in, in all of the, the vast majority have you know lower than our 150 criteria CT index. So we're, we're pushing all of our mixes to be stiffer, drier. And that's, and everyone knows it's gonna be more crack susceptible, especially in a freeze thaw cycle, and especially in the Northeastern climate, that's not ideal. Um, so as far as implementation of the balanced mix design effort, we're kind of focusing more on approach B because it's lower risk than C and D, but it gives us some options, a range of asphalt contents instead of just a singular verification at one asphalt content target. It allows you some idea how to be able to shift that, uh, that target, how to be able to move that volumetric optimum. Um, so we're gonna use a volumetric design for the contractor, perform the, the lab testing at the asphalt content, plus and minus a half percent, uh, check against our performance criteria, our preliminary criteria. Um, well, then we need to do the moisture damage test. Right now we're using the Hamburg for that, but if we try to move away from the Hamburg zone, we still need to make sure that, that, that there is a moisture sensitivity to the design. That can be assessed just at the design level up front, but as you change asphalt, it's in different suppliers. Um, I just not confident that you can just do it once and say it's done for the design. Um, check you know, and then again, check against that criteria, yet unset, but once if it meets everything at that point, then it's approved design. Uh, right now, the primary test we're doing uh, for rutting is a Hamburg wheel tracker uh, and, and the ideal RT, uh, or the rutting test index. Uh, you can see here for the cracking, the AMPT, the SAP value, uh, and the ideal CT with the CT index. Uh, we intend to look into the moisture, into the mist as a, to be able to assess the moisture sensitivity, um, but we don't have any criteria yet. All numbers here are preliminary, uh, except for the Hamburg. That is implemented. Everything else, the ideal RT is just from literature, some of the recent work. Uh, the SAP value is recommendation from North Carolina State University. Uh, and the CT index of 150 is from uh, the NETC 18-2 study uh, that you can find online. It's a Northeastern work that they compared some of our ideal CT data to field performance um, and found that the criteria of 150 um, is actually what we would be what we would need. Now, I will give a caveat there that that's also not for a four-hour aged mix. At this point, we're trying to focus more on the relationship between what's being produced out in the field and the lab so that we can have some, some transition uh, and the opportunity potentially to be able to do for QC and QA. Um, so on top the next level over benchmarking that we're looking into 
um, is being able to provide contractors with the ability to improve their designs. So we've started investigating, doing some research work. We started with just one mixed design uh, and the, intending on shifting the grade. So you try to capture the effect of what's a different PG grade on these indices. Um, the asphalt content, the three different points so we can actually get some sort of relationship. Um, and we started with just the Hamburg wheel tracker and the AMPT, the more in-depth uh, tests. Um, after looking at some of that preliminary data, we found that there were, there were points that just didn't make sense. Data was broken, things, things, it just, it just didn't work out. But after that, that point, we did so much work, so much involved testing, we couldn't just replace it, the mix was gone. So that kind of made us think, it's like, all right, maybe we need to look at some more of these basic tests, if you will, um, to get that, that we can, that we feel have some value. Um, so we, we then increased it to go with four PG grades, 6428, 64E28, which is a polymer modified, 64E28T, that's just kind of our local name, turnpike grade binder, um, has a minimum, mass, uh, minimum uh, polymer content of two and a half percent. Some of our contractors we were finding were using this, this bumped up 64E28 to be able to meet Hamburg testing. Um, and so once that was indicated, it's like, all right, let's try to capture that in the data and share that with the other rest of the industry. Um, and then 76E minus 34, I just asked uh, one of our primary binder suppliers to give me the best binder that you can, what you think is your, you know, your best. And they call it their bulletproof binder. So it's like, I just want to know where it ranks. Is it worth it? Do you know, does, does, the, does the data show it? Um, we did the hammer wheel tracker uh, and AMPT as well again, but then we include, now we included the ideal CT and the ideal RT, quicker, more fundamental tests that just to be able to see, does it work? Does it, do we capture the, the realistic uh, implications here? Are we going to get the improvement in crack resistance when we increase the asphalt content? Are we gonna get the improvement and rut resistance when we increase the, the PG grade, the high temperature PG grade. Um, here's an example of some of the data. I'm just gonna go a little bit quick into our mix design two. This mix design was a, a, a design that we believe was a good performer. It laid well, performed well. Um, so we wanted to start with something that we knew was decent. Volumetric design, the volumetric design looked and, 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 and seemed to, to perform well. Um, you can see here that the, the volumetric optimum, the contractors uh, shows 5.7 based on their volumetric mix design. Um, when you do a linear fit to, their, to their, their submittal, it actually came up closer to a six. That's why uh, the central point is at six. But um, you see the volumetric optimum falls within the performance range. The acceptable range is that green area. Um, and so in this case, the volumetric design meets the performance criteria. So makes sense. Uh, this one here is compa comparing the, the, uh, the RT index and the CT index, that, those, those quicker, you know, more fundamental tests. Uh, when we increase the, the, the binder grade, we see an increase in the performance window. So as far as the low end, uh, it's, it stayed consistent, it, you know, that, that, as far as that, that lower limit. But you gain a lot on the upper end, on the higher asphalt content. And this was a good indication, though, that we're not really gaining the value in a higher modified binder without additional binder. You need to have enough of that binder to be able to really gain your value. So you need more of the more expensive binder to realize the gains. Um, I'm gonna actually use the whole slide here and share just to show some of the comparison of all four uh, PG grades and the effect as you go from you know, clockwise, lower left, up around. You see that performance window continue to increase. As you increase the grade, you're able to put it, you know, you're, you're able to get a much larger window. So some designs uh, will be a very tight window. And that really limits you with that production variability, you know, as far as you, you're, you're at risk for failing your performance criteria. So with those, some of those designs, you may need to be able to, may need to increase your grade. Um, this, again, this is just CT and RT. This was one of them that the volumetric, the volumetric design fell within all, all the criteria. Uh, performance method A, you you know the the BMD approach A uh, would just be yes it meets so you can just go with the 6428 and it's adequate and that may be that may be best that may be fine um, but in in cases where you have a, you know increased risk of rutting or or increased cracking concerns um, you can use you know you can use an increased by you need you can use a higher grade binder but you need more of it. Um, this is just quick as a shot of to give you some financial aspect here, some association to the cost uh, implications. Uh, so as you go, you know, base 6428 at $600 a ton, 
And you see that increase in cost as you go counterclockwise, you know, the, the, the cost increase can be significant, but are you seeing a performance gain? Uh, there's been recent discussion, you know, the, some of the presentation that AAPT was talking about how the CTNX doesn't really capture the polymer modification. The rutting does, it, you know, it's shown in the rutting, but it doesn't really capture it with the CT index until you get into higher levels of modification. You know, so you look at the lower, lower left, the 6428 is about 200. You go to 64E, it's a little over 200. It's not an in insignificant bump, but it's not that significant. But then you look in the top left corner with CT index of 337, that's significant. So some of the, the statements about it not capturing the polymer modification, there's validity to it. But once you get enough of that polymer, once you have enough of a network, uh, you, you do see cracking improvement. Now, just a real quick on the writing, on, on the those more complicated tests, the, the Hamburg wheel tra tracker um, and the AMPT cyclic fatigue. You see that the 60, with the 6428, uh, it shows that the volumetric design was unbalanced. The design is too soft. We need to decrease the asphalt content. We need less of it for it to perform. That's not the case that we saw in the field. It was actually a good, good design, remember? So that didn't really make sense. The secondary point, you know, the graph there, we would have to replace that third point with the red, the red data point. That's not reasonable. We know it's not right. As you increase the asphalt content, you're not gonna have a significantly worse or significantly more crack susceptible mix. It's just, it's, it's, not, it's not realistic. It's not, it's, it doesn't meet real world. So. All that work that was done, all the replicates for that data point is gone. Now we have to go back, we have to go back and start it all over again. Um, and again, to fill out the whole picture, there's the other two binder grades. So that 164E point, well then once we went to the 64E28T and the, the bulletproof binder, you see a significantly increased window. One thing we also learned here is that simply applying linear interpolation and extending it way outside of what you've actually tested is wrong. You look at this, this, the, uh, the, those top two graphs there, it's saying that you can, I mean, you look at that red line, think about where that projects out to. It's saying that you can have a crack susceptible, you know, a, a good crack resistant mix down to no, with no binder. It just keeps going. So you can't extend, we, we found that, you, you know, you have to work within your testing range. We, we can't interpolate, uh, we can't really extend that data out past what the, the testing range. And again, the cost associated to it, you do see an increase in the crack resistance um, with the polymer modification on, of the SAP value. So that does that did capture um, the, the, the polymer modification better than the ideal CT, um, but it's a much more complicated test. Um, and when something goes wrong, you have to go back and start over with a very complicated long test. Um, just and now the Hamburg wheel tracker. This is just a quick glimpse of some of the work that we started looking into. Is just comparing the uh, the ideal RT with the Hamburg wheel tracker um, rutting resistance index, the index value that includes the wheel passes and the rut depth. Um, there is ranking the mixes the same. So if we can run a test in 30 seconds and it's going to and, and we're finding it's ranking the mixes the same as a test that takes six hours up to you know, running the full 20,000 passes. I'm going with something that I can run in 30 seconds, especially when I can run four replicates and have some sort of confidence about the results. Now, this is very preliminary. Don't take this as a face value, but we, I don't actually even condone comparing one test to another. It was just an interesting thing, the, an interesting thing that we just kind of looked at and was like, huh, all right, it's ranking them the same. So maybe there's some validity to be able to use the ideal RT as a surrogate. Uh, so some takeaways, I don't know what I'm doing on time, but it's at the end now. Uh, the ideal CT and the ideal RT provide quick, reasonable results. Um, that they, they just they make sense. They fit what we see in the field. Now the CT, the ideal CT and ideal RT, they're simple, cost-effective, rapid tests, and they're performed on one machine, one relatively inexpensive machine that most contractors, most agencies already have a load frame. Uh, so the the uh, AMPT SAP value uh, takes a lot more material, time, and effort uh, than the ideal CT, and a lot more training. So um, the rutting resistance index, the, the Hamburg wheel tracker rut value and the ideal CT rut value, the RTI, uh, result in similar performance predictions. So there may be some validity to using it as a surrogate. Um, we recommend testing at three binder contents as recommended in you know, some of the, you know, the method B uh, and, and, and the PP105. 
because it gives you some idea about what happens during the production variability and what do you need to do to be able to improve what direction. When you just have one data point, uh, does it just barely meet? Uh, there's Yes, there's some validity to that. It does at least help fill out the, you know that it's going, or you hope that it's going to perform well, but is it really balanced? They can't really balance it with just a single data point. Um, moving forward, we're going to focus a lot more, a lot of our effort on the ideal CT and the ideal RT. Some of the questions we have is how do performance tests of the lab produced mixtures compare with the plant produced mixtures? When we do our mixed design with lab produced and then we go out to the plant, how do, the, how do those index values compare? Uh, we really need to have multi phase analysis to be able to look at the lab produced, plant produced, and production and the compaction variability. Uh, can we develop a reliable relationship between plant produced? and lab compacted specimens and cores, the field compacted specimens. Can we, you know, with that QC, QA, can we use performance tests as a, as a, as a quality control tool? Can we decrease some of the volumetric you know, assessment during production? Uh, how do mixes perform in the field when the asphalt contents result in properties outside of the volumetric design criteria, outside of our, our, our volumetric specification limits? When we need to bump that asphalt content, we're gonna need to change those volumetric limits um, how do those perform out in the field? We don't, don't know. We have to talk our management to letting us try it and paying for it. Uh, and can and should we consider using 62 millimeter specimens for a bulk? It's just something just to think about. It's like, you know, we have to create all these 62 millimeter specimens for all these index tests now, the CT, RT, Hamburg Wheel Tracker. Is it feasible? Is it possible to be able to use those for bulk? So then you have several repli replicates for your bulk specimens. So I just, just wondering, because I mean, T166 suggests that one to one and a half times the nominal max. So if you're using 12.5 nominal max aggregate mixture, 62 millimeter specimen, that should work. Um, but then I, I've, I've talked to some people about it. There's concerns about the gyratory angle, the fact that it, the, the implications, how that relates to the field, compact you know, the field, the traffic levels. It's just uh, something I'd, I'd, I'd be interested in some of the doctors out there to look into if it's possible. And um, the never ending questions, they're going to continue is what test is right? No one knows. The important thing is what's test, what test is right for you? What test is right for your concerns, your distresses? Uh, what temperature is right? Uh, it's always another good one. Is, should we be testing the ideal CT at 25, in te at 25 degrees Celsius in, in Texas and in Maine? Should we vary the temperature and then keep the same test criteria? Or should we keep the same temperature and vary the test criteria, which, which way is right? I mean, the different tests, different states, different agencies do it differently. Which way is better? Uh, what aging protocol is right? That's another good one. All right, so it'd be 95 degrees for five days, 135 or two hours, four hours, eight hours. Should we be, which, should we be aging the mix? Should we be aging the binder? Can we create a relationship between the aged binder and the mix? And not have to age the binders. As you know, there's the aging debate's going to go on forever. The important thing is if you pick something up front that works for you. In our case, right now, we're looking at what relates to field. You know, we want to be able to do a lab, uh, you know, a production, a, a design based on lab production, lab samples, and have it relate to field. Um, the cracking test, yes, you need to have increased aging to be able to truly understand how it's going to age, how it's going to act on the field. We don't have a lot of different binder sources to, 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 to work with here. And after you do all that aging up front with your design, the contractor switches the grade, switches the binder source on you. How valid is all that aging work you did with that design, all that long-term aging? It, it's, in my mind, it's not that valid. I, I, I think we have a little more focus on the binder aging and trying to create some relationship to the mix design, uh, the mix aging. Um, so you can do a short-term aging of the mix and have some confidence, some idea of the cracking susceptibility long-term. Uh, and what criteria is right? Benchmarking is all about trying to have some idea of how much, how many of our mixes are going to go bad? How many designs are no longer going to meet our specifications if we apply this certain criteria? Um, so what criteria is right? The association, how that associates and, and relates to field performance is the only true way to be able to choose your criteria. Uh, and every state, every agency is going to be different. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you for your opportunity. I know I took a, a lot much longer than I needed to, but I took advantage of uh, the extra time. So um, I don't know if you want to do questions now or, okay. Thank you guys. If people have questions online.
Van's going to get up in a minute and, and ask us. So John, go ahead. Anybody? Anybody? <laughs> oh, no. I mean, you did a great job, Casey. Great. John D'Angelo consultant. Uh, you know, and you've done a tremendous amount of work. I do have a, a comment for you, though. Um, primarily, you were talking about a lot of these tests, you know, that they were developed and some people just test like at 25, mostly. Well, I think you're 100% right that we can't test at one temperature because they're, they're meant to look at a material at a certain stress level and a certain modulus. And for example, if you're using a minus 28 in Maine and someone's using a minus 16 in uh, Texas, at those critical temperatures where things crack, if you just test one temperature, you're gonna you're gonna miss those points, and you have to adjust the temperature. Now, it's a little bit more complicated, a little bit more work to reestablish the testing at those different temperatures. Mm -hmm. But if you really want to look at cracking in Maine as opposed to cracking in Texas, you have to change the test temperature, not change the criteria because the the, the material react differently if you just do it all at the same temperature. So it, it's critical to do that. I agree. Good morning, Casey. Thank you for the presentation. That was amazing. Uh, I thought I asked for a lot of testing, but after seeing your numbers, 3,200 tests and then so on, that's an amazing database. My question is, uh, I assume you're talking number of tests per replicate and not mixes, if I'm not mistaken. That's correct. Those are individual tests. Okay. Is the number high because you're trying to achieve a certain variability or because you had a lot of mixes? So we intentionally are right now we're, we're using three uh, replicates for the CT, RT and high and, and the high temperature IDT. Um, and the, we just use the typical four specimens for the Hamburg. Um, so the reason that we're running so many tests right now is we want to try to benchmark where our data stands. So that that's we don't we don't intend on running, keeping this up. We can't keep this up. My The, the lab is not happy with me. And, you know, basically, so we're just yeah, we're trying so. to do everything we can. <laughs> How are you defining your variability? So, so right now, the, I mean, statistics on three samples, um, it's questionable. Um, it just, it gives us an assessment. Uh, right now, it's basically, we're, we're choosing three primarily because that's what the specification calls for. Um, so we're not, we're not trying to define variability right now necessarily. Um, but if you were, if I was to talk about the test, I would say the coefficient of variation uh, within those replicates. Yeah, I'm interested in seeing your database for the 76E minus 28. Uh, uh, I have another question, something that caught my attention in the presentation. You mentioned retained cores for CT index testing. I assume you've done testing on the cores. Yes, we've run about 1,300 cores. And uh, how you're looking to include that into your, your database? Or so right now, criteria? right now, I haven't. We haven't had any time to look at the data yet. That's a big. That's a, the big issue with the agency. Uh, we're lucky enough to have some support. We were able to have Nico Tre uh, Trebway. We, we hired one person uh, that's done all of our CT, RT, um, and ideal, you know, ideal CT, RT, and the high temperature IDT. He's ran majority of the AMPT. Uh, so we, we've, we've been lucky to have one person that's being able to focus and work on all of this, um, which is a huge with benchmarking, being able to do this. But yeah, I'm very interested in seeing how you're going to include that portion into the entire work because it's a different. Yeah, you know, it's, yeah and typically we just throw the cores out, just like these dispute mixes. Um, so I just asked, like, can we break them first? We measure, you know, we, we get three different measurements, so they don't necessarily meet the full specification as the full as the parallelism parallelism of the sides. But how do does it need to? We, you know, we just yeah, we we're just it was just uh, we're throwing them out anyway. It doesn't take very long to get them up to twenty five C and break them. Um, so let's break them before we throw them out. See, see if the data shows anything. I like, we like to try to make data-driven decisions instead of feelings. Uh, but. I agree, thank you. Yep. Hi, Casey, thanks for the great presentation. I think you brought up a bunch of great points. Uh, Hassan Tawatawai with Cargill here. Um, one thing I wanted to, maybe I, I have two parts of that question. First one, um, I'll start with the question. Are you also doing a, um, you know, a secondary, maybe cracking test or damage test, perhaps on, um, on the side, maybe not for all 3,200, but is there a, another index, I think with the AMPT maybe that you're looking at as well, um, to kind of see 
what type of, what another measure of cracking performance might be giving you for the same mixes? So, so yeah, that, that's what I was showing. We, we've done work with APT SAP value, um, that cracking indice, um, and the ideal CT. Uh, and I, there's no way I can include another, another test. We just, well, I think this, I think that SAP will probably do. Um, I think that, uh, and I have not seen as much of that data as I have seen, you know, some of that, let's say, um, let's, in addition to the ideal, if I'm looking at tests with a you know, simpler te uh, loading kind of scheme or stress strain type of setup that really stresses the binder, you know, look at something like the overlay test or, uh, or the DCT. And where I'm going with this is, you know, something that I've been seeing, and, uh, and this is, you know, I'm going to oversimplify here is that I appreciate you know, it. if we <laughs> look at uh, damage, uh, these damage tests, we're looking at binder quality and binder quantity and how they're affecting our cracking performance. And it's becoming pretty clear as, you know, I'm looking at the di uh, different tests that some tests are going to tends towards uh, telling you quantity is important, well, uh, more important than quality, and others will go with quality. And ideal is one of those that seems to be tending towards, you know, putting more binder is going to be a quicker way of improving your performance than putting in a better binder, perhaps. Um, if you did the same test, perhaps with an overlay tester, you would probably see that you could, you know, improve your grade and get the same improvement by percentage, let's say that you would instead of putting in, you know, 0.4% binder, which one's actually more representative of what you're going to see in the field. You know, I, I think the jury is still out and I think that's good that you're, you know, getting all of these materials. I think all of us will use that, but I think an interesting trend we'll probably start seeing is the test, the states that are, uh, you know, start adjusting designs by ideal will probably start seeing, you know, 0.4 to 0.5% higher binder contents than states that are going with, you know, more direct tension type tests. And we'll probably see that design starting to get approved that would have used a V grade now using, or use a, using an H or E is now using a V, but used a little bit more binder. Folks that would have done a you know grade dump to put a higher wrap might say, hey, I don't need a grade dump. I'm putting 0.4% more binder. I'm seeing the same results. And I think we'll all wonder, did we fix the cracking problem now or not? And I think those companion tests are going to be important for us to start to understand if, you know, make sure things don't go sideways on us. No, yeah, I, and I agree. But as far as an agency um, and many contractors and the real world, outside of the research world, uh, we have personnel limitations, time limitations, material limitations, you know, pay limitations. So it's, we can't, we can't do these high level tests all the time, and especially during production. So Absolutely. using it for mixed design, the initial mixed design phase, that yes, that there's some validity there. Um, but we need to have something, if we're gonna be able to assess the performance when we change the binder source and grade during production, we need to have an ability to, to, to quantify that performance, that, that change of performance. Um, and we can't, we, we can't do a AMPT every 2000 tons of mix. It's, oh no, I think it's more on the data set, I meant maybe on your extremes, maybe there's, 50 points for your 3,200 points here, but just to kind of maybe have some point of correlation. Yes. Yep. No, I, I and I, and so, I fully agree. Uh, we're going to have to uh, go to, we've got a few online questions we want to get to, and, and then uh, we'll kind of wrap it up. And let um, Steve have a talk. Okay. Yeah, we, we do have questions from uh, the online group. Okay. Yeah, we do have a few questions from online attendees. Uh, the, I grouped them together somehow. Uh, the first set of question was regarding the impact of specimen reheating. Uh, the question from Joe Schur asking, how do reheated specimens compare to project-made specimens? And also a similar question asked by, you know, Oak Matt Cafe from Montana. He said, uh, I have the same question as Joe. We have evidence that shows reheating Homburg specimen never fail, while field specimen and the road course of the same mix is failed. So I, I don't know if, if they saw that side, that, that quick snapshot where I showed the Hamburg wheel tracker versus the CT index, uh, you see that there are many mixes that fail. Um, those are plant produced mixes. Um, so when you talk about, when you talk about project specimens, I'm assuming they mean plant produced uh, specimens. Um, we have failures. 
Uh, and that's most often addressed with, with a more polymer modified binder. Honestly, that's, it, it's, it works to improve the running resistance. Um, but right now I don't have a good feel as far as the relationship between the cores um, and the field produced mix because we primarily do our Hamburg testing on plant produced lab compacted specimens. Okay, fair enough. Uh, the next question um, is more like a comment than question from Tom Bennett uh, with Rutgers University. Uh, he said, in a low bit system, I think it will be rare to see mix truly balanced unless there will be a pay adjustment for performance above and beyond the minimum. In most cases, you will probably see mix design to meet the minimum cracking requirements with this rotting simply falling in place by default, similar to what Randy had mentioned about during the introduction section. You will see mixes designed towards the balance condition to ensure inherent variability does not result in a falling result, but the true balance may not be seen in a low bit environment. So it's a comment. Like yeah, no, and that's a valid comment. Uh, and he's, he's, he's obviously fully aware that we're all, we're all locked into a low bit environment. Um, but if we want to realize the gains of these increased, these more expensive binders, we, we're going to need to increase the asphalt contents. And that gives some of the regress voids options, super pay five ideas. Some of these other theories in like Vermont was even saying how they, you know, or while Ann Stacy was saying how they, they, their designs have increased asphalt contents. They found that the increase in asphalt content was part of this performance testing. Um, and I guarantee all agencies are going to generally see the same thing because contractors are going to want to under asphalt the mix or put as little bit as they can because it's low bit. You can make more money. Sounds good. Well, we do have a few more questions because of the time we won't be able to address them, but after the meeting, we'll get with Casey to address them. Thank you. All right. Thank you all for your time.